Hi, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Nikhil Koradkar. I'm the John A. Clark and Edward T. Cross and Endowed Chair here at RPI. My research speciality over the last four to five years has been graphene, and I'd like to speak to you today about what is graphene, why is it special, and I'd like to discuss some applications of graphene. The outline of my talk is as follows. Um, I'm going to speak about what is graphene, what is the structure of graphene, how do we manufacture graphene? Um, there are two ways of doing it, uh, bottom up and top down. So I'll talk about both methods and I'll discuss some of the key high impact applications of graphene. So what is graphene? Graphene is an ideal two dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. Uh, the thickness of a graphene sheet is one carbon atom. So we're talking about 0.3 nanometers, but the lateral dimensions could be of the order of inches. So it could be tens of inches. Uh, but the thickness is only 0.3 nanometers. So it's got an incredibly high aspect ratio. The carbon-carbon bonding is one of the strongest in nature. So you get very high modulus, very high strength. The surface area is very large because every atom is a surface atom. Uh, it's a semi-metal, it has zero band gap. Uh, electrons are very mobile in graphene. Now I've made this uh, item bolded. And the reason why I've made it bolded is I want to convey that this is only true if a graphene sheet is freestanding. If you put it on a substrate, then you start seeing scattering from the substrate and so these numbers go down. But if you have an ideal freestanding floating graphene sheet, then, then definitely electrons are very mobile um, in graphene. The thermal transport properties are excellent. This number of 5000 watt per meter Kelvin is one of the best in nature. But again, it's true, again, I bolded this item because it's only true for a suspended graphene sheet. Moment a graphene sheet is supported on a substrate, you start uh, seeing leakage effects and things like that, and this number drops down. Uh, graphene is optically transparent because it's so thin, most of light passes through it. Um, it's the thinnest uh, substance that you can get. Uh, it's one carbon atom thick. It's inert and impermeable, so nothing can pass through it and it's highly flexible, so you can bend it and twist it and so on and so forth. So certainly graphene is a very special material. Now how do we make graphene? So there are two ways of doing it. One is top down. Top down means you start from graphite, and graphite already contains graphene sheets. So graphite is basically billions of graphene sheets that are stacked together. The question is how do we exfoliate it? And the way we exfoliate it in my lab is we oxidize it. So we use strong acids to create graphene oxide, as, sh as shown in the slide. And then the graphene oxide has a greater interlayer spacing between the graphene, and it's much more weakly bound. So we can exfoliate it very easily by giving it a thermal shock. So that's what I've shown in the slide. You give it a very high rate of heating, uh, and then you can basically open up the structure and you get these individual um, graphene platelets. Top-down method, uh, after we make the graphene, we can see it under a transmission electron microscope. And what you find is the graphene sheet dimensions are of the order of microns, but its thickness is or of the order of one to, one to two nanometers. So we end up with three to four layer graphene platelets. We don't get individual graphene sheets. We'd love to get individual sheets, but we end up with three to four layer platelets. The second method of making graphene is bottom up. So here what you do is you assemble graphene atom by atom. And this is done in a high temperature reactor where you flow in a, a hydrocarbon gas. The hydrocarbon breaks apart and the carbon atoms then stick to a suitable substrate like copper as shown in this slide. Uh, the carbon atoms then assemble together to form grains. The grains grow larger in size until they merge together and then you get this large size graphene sheet that grows on copper. We can also grow graphene on nickel. After growing it, I can transfer it onto silicon, for example. So we're not limited to just copper and nickel. We, can, we, we need to grow it on copper and nickel, but we can transfer it onto any substrate um, that you can think of. So here in this example, we've transferred it onto silicon, and we can contact it, and we can measure various properties of, of the graphene. We can also transfer onto rough surfaces. So on this slide, I have uh, copper nanorods, and you see the surface is very rough. And you might think, can we really transfer graphene onto this? And the answer is yes, as shown on the next slide. This is a single layer graphene drape, uh, sort of like a nano blanket, and we can transfer it onto, um, onto the surface. Application, so I've shown you I can make graphene top down or bottom up. Um, I can transfer it onto any other substrate. I can contact it. 
the question is, uh, what are the applications of this material? So there are four applications that I'm looking at in my lab. One is devices, the other is composites, the third is coatings, and finally is energy. So let's cycle through all of these. Devices. Um, the first thing we looked at in my lab was sensors. Uh, because every atom in graphene is a surface atom, you get an enormous surface area. And so uh, if anything sticks to the graphene sheet, for example, a gas species, um, it's going to change the way electrons move in graphene. So using this principle, we can get a, 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 an extremely sensitive gas sensing device. We can sense down to the parts per billion level. Uh, we've also used this graphene sheet. Uh, we know it's impermeable. We know that nothing passes through it. Even a proton is not able to pass through graphene. But if we can engineer holes in it, so if we can open uh, you know, sub-nanometer size holes in, in the sheet, then we can pass uh, water, but we can block salts. And the reason is that a salt is um, surrounded by a hydration shell, which makes it quite big. And so uh, while the, the salt will not pass through these sub-nanometer size holes, the water will. So we can make membranes to, to hopefully try to take salt out of water. Uh, so desalination is a very important uh, grand challenge. Uh, we're also looking at things like flexible electronics. So the idea is that the existing electronic devices right now are brittle. You can't bend it, you can't stretch it. But if you use graphene-based uh, electronics, you might be able to do that because graphene is bendable, stretchable. So these are some key uh, device applications that we're looking at. We're also looking at composites. Um, and here we're looking at structural applications. We want to improve the thermal, mechanical, and electrical properties of a polymer matrix into which we insert or infiltrate the, the graphene. In addition to polymers, we're also looking at uh, ceramics. We're looking at metal matrices like aluminum and copper. And we're trying to introduce graphene into all of these and improve their properties. The main thing we found which makes graphene special is that the amount of graphene we need is very low. So the loading fraction of the nanofiller that we have to introduce is very low compared to other types of nanofillers like carbon nanotubes and nanoparticles. So graphene is a very potent nanofiller. It's very effective at very low loading fractions. We're also looking at coating. So uh, I can use a graphene coating to change the way water interacts with the surface. And I can go from super hydrophobic, where the water hates the surface, to super hydrophilic, where the water loves the surface. So I can tune the, the properties in a very wide range. Why is that important? Because if you want low friction, low drag coatings, if you want surfaces that are um, anti-fouling, that don't get dirty, then uh, being able to control the way water interacts with the surface is very important. And we can do that using graphene. Uh, we can also passivate surfaces. So if I coat a surface with graphene, Nothing passes through graphene. Um, so oxygen is also not able to pass through. So I can prevent surfaces from rusting, from oxidizing. So I can passivate very large areas, which is um, you know, very useful in many applications. So coatings is the third area we're looking at. And the final area is energy. Um, so energy, where can graphene be useful in terms of the energy uh, context? And the answer is mainly as uh, electrodes in batteries. So we're looking at making new types of anodes and cathodes that are based on graphene. Um, and this could result in new types of batteries that work much better than uh, existing batteries. Uh, we're looking at solar cells. Um, again, we are thinking that quantum uh, graphene quantum dots can be used uh, to make uh, solar cells run better and be more efficient. Um, let me give you an example of um, one application of graphene in the area of energy. Um, now, if you look at a lithium ion battery, which is uh, the most common battery in your laptops and cell phones and PCs and, and things like that, uh, it uses a graphite anode. So you've got a source of lithium and these lithium ions are inserted into a, a graphite anode when you charge. And when you discharge, these lithium ions are transferred back from the graphite anode back into the cathode. So the lithium ions rock back and forth between the anode and the cathode. And right now, anodes uh, are made of graphite, and graphite dominates the market. So it's a billion dollar market, and, and everyone uses graphite-based um, slurries. Now what we've done is we have pioneered the use of a graphene structure. So instead of using graphite, we exfoliate the structure, and then we reassemble it in a way such that we create a very open pore expanded structure, as I've shown you in this, um, in this slide. And now we have a lot of space to accommodate a lot more lithium. So we are able to store 
two to three times more lithium than the existing batteries out there. And what that means is that the energy density of our system is much higher than an existing graphite anode. So on the next slide, I've shown you uh, a plot where I have power density on the y-axis and I've got energy density on the x-axis. And I've marked out the regions where you have uh, the classical capacitors as well as batteries. And as you can see, we have significantly more energy density than an existing battery. But we also have higher power densities, which is very interesting. Um, because if you want to charge your laptop in, let's say, a few minutes as opposed to an hour, then you need power density. And um, existing batteries give you very low power density. You know, it takes hours to charge your battery. And the reason is that it takes a long time for lithium ions to diffuse into the structure. But because we have this expanded open pore structure, um, the distances through which the lithium ions have to conduct is much smaller in our case. So we can basically pump the lithium in and out at very high rates. And so we can not only store a lot of lithium, but we can uh, inject and insert it in and out of the structure at very high speed. So we can get very high power densities and very high energy densities. Um, so we have a much better device than an existing graphite anode. So this was just one practical example that I wanted to show you. And it's also very stable. If you look at the next slide, we've cycled our graphene anode, we've charged and discharged it for more than 6,000 cycles. And it's very stable, as you can see in, in uh, the plot. So hopefully, we, I've been able to show you that graphene is indeed a very special uh, material. And it has some very unique uh, properties. And we can harness these properties to make real devices that could have real impact. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, listening to me.